Um, hello, I'm Thomas, I'm from CERN. Uh, we'll be talk talking about how we are using uh, GitHub at CERN. I will give you a small uh, ID. And uh, this is what CERN looks like when there's snow. This picture is from a few years ago, so it's not exactly the same anymore. We have a big car park now, close to here. Um, the second part of the talk will be, uh, I will go through my Koji infrastructure as well. So we are using Koji. Does everybody know what is Koji in this room? Or you need a bit of detail? No? Yes? <laughs> Mike needs... I've heard of it. It's, it's something <laughs> that someone built, I don't remember. Okay, so um, uh, yeah. let's start. I will just give us the usual yeah. intro. So we have a lot of uh, accelerators. We have a big one called LHC, so this is the one uh, that uh, allowed us to, to discover the Higgs boson. And the goal of this accelerator is to boost particles in a 27 kilometer loop and to collision them, basically. And each side, the, the energy is 6.5 TeV, and when they collision it at 13 TeV. So this is since uh, the last upgrade, we managed to go up to 13 TeV. So what's going on now? Uh, we have a long shutdown. So for two years, we are stopping the machine, and we upgrade uh, various things. Uh, this time, it's mainly a maintenance uh, upgrade. We, don't, we upgrade uh, part of uh, the cabling, uh, part of uh, the captor, but we, the next upgrade will be something bigger, where we change the definition, the high luminosity will be called, and we change basically uh, the, the size and definition of the picture we take at the detector level. But for this one, it's a preparation for the next upgrade. And then we will run from 2022 to 2024, and then there will be this uh, high luminosity upgrade. And this is uh, one of the challenges for IT is to, to cope with that, because uh, we will get uh, a fold of uh, 100 in terms of storage and everything. So we hope technology will be helping, but for the moment, uh, finger crossed. So, um, one more thing that I wanted to advertise to everybody, on the 14th and 15th of September, uh, we open everything so everybody can go to visit the LHC and uh, they can go down underground. So this, hap this is happening every six years. So if you're around, if uh, you want to visit CERN, I'll be giving two of the data center as well. So this is one of the last data center in Europe you can visit. So we can through racks and you can see uh, what is going on with uh, OpenStack, OpenShift, and everything uh, around. So please, if you need more info, you can go to this website. It's not yet uh, very detailed, but uh, as soon as the the event uh, schedule is announced, you will have more info. There will be some debate, film screening. It's really nice for kids, so if you have kids, come with them. They can't go underground, but they can play with some uh, like uh, really cool stuff. So that's it. Uh, just to show the numbers of machine, uh, Linux machine we have at this time. So as you know, before 7, we were based on scientific Linux, so we didn't migrate. We still use scientific Linux for 6. So at this time, we are Half, half. So 25,000 of our machines are scientific Linux and 25,000 are CC7. And look, no more SLC5. How beautiful is this graph? <laughs> Officially, our support ends um, uh, on the 31st of March. So because we had extended support uh, for some experiments that couldn't migrate. And now the long shutdown happened. So we told them, you have three months after the long shutdown to completely get rid of this thing. We, so tickets will go to slash dev null now. So it's a really good thing for us. Uh, just to give you an idea as well, we have, uh, I, I zoomed a bit, so this one I talked about. Uh, this is uh, all the different labs and companies that are using our distribution server, so it's to give you an idea. This is uh, the red point, are over 8 million requests a week, so this is uh, on a weekly basis, and it shows that uh, when we do change and when we move to a next version, it doesn't affect only us, it affects quite a lot of people. So we need to keep that in mind every time uh, we have to move around. Um, I just wanted to, I thought I had another slide. We have 600 licenses of RHEL, so mainly seven now, and few, mainly six, sorry, and a few seven. And that will completely change, um, basically, in yeah, in April we'll start to migrate most of that to to seven, and same for 
for SFC6, our batch system, which is the, doing the physics calculation, will switch 30% in the next week uh, more to CC7, and like uh, before the end of the year, it will be switched 100%. So we'll still have 10,000 nodes on six, <coughs> which are not controlled by us. It's controlled by, this is people installing uh, internally uh, SFC6, so that we don't have control, but the data center, hopefully by the end of the year, will be migrated mostly to, to seven. So we can start to look at eight. <laughs> That's it. Um, so why GitLab? So our IT department is using Git for for a bit longer than the experiment because uh, we are geeks and everything was going on on GitHub, right? So everybody was starting to use Git. We had a little service uh, to replace SVN uh, based on Git, uh, and after that uh, we 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 decided that we wanted a bit more. So so the chosen product was uh, GitLab. And uh, GitLab is a much, much more... I took a screenshot for their website. This is quite uh, amazing. They are doing a lot of things. So today I will go through what is uh, container registry, what is continuous integration, uh, show you issues maybe, uh, things that you can do in GitLab. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot of part of GitLab that, um, that uh, are evolving. Uh, somewhere, something really interesting, but I have no info, is this part. They plan to do Linux package registry. So maybe the talk I'm presenting today will be obsoleted uh, soon. Because you could create uh, RPM and repository directly in GitLab. But uh, I don't have really info, so if someone knows what is going on there, let me know. But this is coming soon, so let's see. Uh, we are using starter edition, so we don't using GitLab core because we needed some Kerberos support which is not available in the core, so we are happy customer of GitLab at this time. GitLab architecture, so I wanted to go through a bit uh, how we install GitLab to give you an idea. So there's a team managing uh, GitLab, I'm not part of this team, so what I may say here, I don't take my word for it, but I can put you in contact if you're interested in deploying a big GitLab uh, instance, let me know, I can put you in contact with the right person. Uh, so, GitLab is deployed on OpenShift uh, with Ansible uh, and uh, we use as well uh, OpenStack Magnum for containers for all the runner for the CI. So basically the CI creates a Kubernetes cluster from OpenStack Magnum. So do you know what is OpenStack Magnum? It's the way to create a container from OpenStack. So this is, instead of going to your instance uh, tab, you go to your container infrastructure tab and you can create a full Kubernetes, a Swarm, or any container you want. So GitLab is uh, taking, uh, is using that uh, to deploy uh, most of the, of the runner. Uh, we have four terabytes of repository at this time. Uh, we are sending all the objects to S3. So GitLab support LFS. So part of LFS, I think it's, it accounts for 0 0.5 tera now. And the other objects are mainly CI artifacts and things like that. So it's growing super fast because six months ago we were around 10 terabytes, now we are 19. So the user, we have a lot of users actually. We have 15,000 users now in GitLab. So it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, a lot. Uh, since this week, in terms of uh, architecture, we moved to Gitali, which is a way to scale the Git uh, storage developed by GitLab. Uh, before, we had only NFS filers, so the 4 terabytes were on NFS filers. And we're moving to Gitali, we hope to get a better response time and to, it will be easier to scale. Uh, it's still a single point of failure like NFS was, so in terms of availability it doesn't change a lot, but in terms of response uh, it's quite good. And uh, we migrated, uh, I think, uh, Monday or Tuesday, so I don't have a lot of experience, but uh, it, it looks really promising. Um, GitLab deploy itself, oh, this is uh, the CI of GitLab deploying itself, so this is uh, basically uh, you can click on play and it will start to deploy all the updates needed uh, to update itself. It's quite nice. I will show you how that works in a minute. Koji. So, just a few words about Koji. Uh, Koji can build RPM source from source RPM from Git URL. Uh, and if you are really uh, crazy like we are, you can build containers with Image Factory as a plugin. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because now there's a lot of uh, newer tools, but uh, for us, uh, at the time, nothing existed and it was making sense. 
So again, if you're interested, I can uh, talk a bit uh, after that uh, about uh, containers. Uh, I put a link to the bigger project if you need more info, and uh, Mike is here if you have questions on Koji, so he will be the best person to ask. <laughs> here he is. Um, we needed this year, one of our challenges, uh, last year, sorry, we are in 2019 already, last year was to migrate uh, Koji to, uh, to the cloud, because in the past we had a NetApp with some uh, builder and uh, hub, basically, which are different parts of Koji, uh, but it was a pretty old architecture where we we couldn't scale really easily and we had Red Hat Cluster Manager. So we basically you had a hub that was active passive and you could get uh, only one hub at the same time. And uh, this year, thanks uh, to, the, to the Linux team, uh, Yarek, Alex, Ulrich, uh, we managed to puppetize everything and to deploy it in a more uh, cloudy way. So basically, uh, the storage is on CephFS, and you can see that uh, the hub, which is uh, basically uh, the API, the core of Koji, um, is running as active-active, and uh, the builder, of course, uh, can be reached by any hub, and the user-facing in web interface as well is two machines. So now we don't have a single point of failure except for the storage but uh, it's always the same storage, uh, HA is hard and expensive, very, very, very expensive. But uh, at least we could reproduce something really interesting um, and uh, it's super nice. In terms of performance, CFFS is really good since, since uh, CentOS 7.6 because now you can use the kernel mount. So for read, it's really improved over the fuse module because we had uh, some issue over the fuse module uh, to connect to CFFS. So, um, what did I say? Yes, 371 users. So we had a big increase um, in the last year because uh, people started to use what I will show you after, like the CI to build the RPMs uh, directly from Koji. And, um, and that's it, apparently, yes. Uh, the migration happened at the end of the year, so we are still looking uh, at like uh, polishing some details. We had SC Linux issue that we didn't expect. Uh, you know that you have this uh, SC Linux Boolean uh, HTTPD can use NFS? Guess what doesn't exist for CFFS? <laughs> so you need to do a bit of policy in SC Linux to fix all that things, which was a bit painful if you want to do it well. You not allow everything or get n for zero because everything runs with SC Linux, of course. And I wanted to make a bit of, uh, of, uh, of advertisement for Ken. Ken is part of the SCLO storage thing, You're working on Ceph, and he's working on, uh, on some uh, resource uh, in Ansible for Koji, to be able to, to do tasks on Koji from Ansible, and I think uh, it looks quite nice. I didn't play a lot with it, but uh, I think it would be nice if we can uh, advertise it and people know it exists. So, I put the link here, my slide will be available after the, the talk. Please check if you're interested in Ansible in Koji. It's really helpful. I put a link to my Puppet uh, manifest as well. They are not yet public. I just realized that five minutes before the talk. So I'll make it public, so try again uh, maybe tomorrow if, um, if, uh, if you want to see how we did it with, uh, with Puppet. Any question on this architecture, which is a bit outside of the talk, but I wanted just to show you that it's possible super easily to deploy Koji. It's not something uh, super hard to deploy, and it's really helpful to build RPMs uh, when you have a lot of users. Okay, good to go. Um, we had another problem. Okay, in the past we had one single master running cron job and uh, doing a repository creation, because when you build something in Koji, then it's not available directly to, for consumption. So you have another tool called MASH, uh, that is maintained by Fedora as well, that creates repository from your Koji tags. So Koji has different tags, and basically you can use MASH to run on this tag, and it will give you the list of packages and nice repo that you can use on your server. So we, we needed a way to run MASH uh, in a cluster way, not anymore as a single machine running, uh, the master runs this cron job. So we came up with a nice Koji plugin, so basically uh, we did the design, but uh, Alex did uh, most of the code, so I will put his, uh, his, uh, his name on the next slide. Uh, and uh, now we are able, 
with a nomad cluster from HashiCorp to execute any task at any time in parallel. So we won as well for the repository time to sync. It's not sequential anymore, so it's really parallelized. And nomad was really super simple to install. And so uh, the, uh, the Koji Hub plugin is just talking to nomad and say, look, someone tags this package, we need to regenerate this repo. Look, someone untags this package, we need to regenerate this repo. So it's really better than what we had uh, until now. And uh, we really like uh, how it got. So you can see that the plugin is working on all these uh, callbacks. So as soon as it receives one of these actions, the callback knows and will regenerate your repo. So it's really nice. And what thing we win as well on that is uh, some repos start to be really big. We have some people rebuilding Oracle stuff that uh, one single RPM is two gigabytes and they keep 15 versions. So it was not nice for all the users because they had to wait uh, for the Oracle guy to finish to build their repository. It was taking uh, over 15 minutes instead of being instant as they were used to. So parallelizing uh, was a big, big win for us. So this is uh, just to show you uh, basically uh, how a Koji plugin looks like. It's super, super <laughs> easy to build. I mean, uh, what we're just doing here, we just dispatch a, dispatch a, jo dispatch a job. You can check. This code is public, so you can uh, click uh, right now. You can just dispatch a, a job to Nomad. And then Nomad will run a, a bash script and just regenerate the repo. So this is. This working super nicely uh, for us, and again, thanks to Alex, who did uh, all the implementation part. It's, uh, it's it was a really really nice project, and we had a lot of fun to design and and do it. Um, just uh, to give you an idea, how now we have Koji, we have GitLab. What's happening? So what we want is to have different stage. So we want that when we build the RPM, it's available to all the testing servers. Uh, now. You would say, ah, but these people will fight and they will have this version of this tool and that version of this tool. So this is a, we solve that with Koji tags. Every uh, team can have his own Koji tag. And then it's configured by Puppet. So at the end, on the machine, what is a Koji tag? It's a set of repository. So on the machine, on the final machine, you have a set of repositories that can be accessed. And the user doesn't see anything else. He just built a package to a Koji tag. And then he can install it on his server. This is, this is the goal of uh, this whole project. And of course, we need uh, to promote package. So for people uh, uh, that know Koji, this operation is called tag. You basically tag a package to a new tag, and then you can regenerate a repo from this new tag. So what we're doing here is uh, each set of tag has different, uh, different name. So it's testing, staging, production, mainly. And uh, this, is, uh, this is how it works. Is this clear? And why we needed that? Because it's important for you to understand why we need to have a per project. Because uh, at CERN, we have different teams building different things, and we don't want to, uh, to intervene. So we provide them a set of tools uh, to build package and to be able to promote them to production. OK, everything's fine. Um, I wanted to show you a simple example of what is GitLab CI. I will do CI in GitLab. So this is the example from the top. So basically, you just need to create one file that looks like that. I take uh, this is a Ruby example, right? Yeah. Yes. With our oh, apt get, I should have taken another example. So uh, this is just the example from the doc. So let me show you now how we're doing it. So we have uh, one repo per RPM, so it's the same uh, as what happened on Pavio. We have uh, one repo per RPM. And then uh, you have this uh, CI file in uh, each repo, and we have different stages. So something at the beginning as well is we put the Koji target. So here, my tag is called PodD. It was Puppet on the desktop. It's a tag that we don't use anymore, so I use it for the demo here because I hope I can do a live demo to show you how it works. Um, the Koji tag, uh, this tag can be <coughs> sent. For us, it's el 7 cern so it shows that we modify this package at CERN in general. But you can put anything you want, right? And after, you have different stages. So this example is not building RPM from Git directly. It's building a source RPM from the CI. So we support both workflow. I took this workflow because it was a bit different and to explain you why. Because we have people that want to build Go or uh, NPM stuff, and the builders don't have, uh, don't have uh, internet access. 
So what they are doing now, they are packaging binaries. So they build in the Koji stage their binary and then they ship it as a RPM. So we need to support both workflow at this time because we don't want the builder ever to have internet access. We want to have reproducible builds. And we don't want people to pull uh, the whole NPM and we don't know what it's built against. So that gives us traceability on what is going on as well. And so there's a few stages, as I mentioned. The two first ones are simple uh, stage which download the, the dependency and create a source RPM. And the second one create a RPM. We are doing that to catch problems because uh, Koji is not... Uh, is not something for CI. You don't want to set all your build to Koji. It's not something we designed at the beginning. So what you want to do is you want to be sure that your RPM can be built before sending it to Koji, right? So again, you can send all the build you want against Koji. For us, it was not uh, at the beginning uh, what we wanted to do. We wanted Koji to be the last part uh, that can ship RPM more than doing CI. So the CI should really happen in GitLab. So, uh, what is going on then? Then, you arrive at the point that, okay, you build pass, you could build the source RPM, you could build the RPM, and now we want to try to set it to Koji and to see what happens. The first step, which is executed every time on each commit, is this case scratch stage. So that sends the build to Koji in the scratch mode. In Koji, scratch mode means that uh, it will just try to build, but not tag any packages. So these packages will be built in Koji, but you won't have uh, any way to ship it in a repository. You can download it, you can test it, it's, it's just to be sure that it works correctly. Um, the second thing is kbuild. So this is the same command exactly with just building the read package. So our tag are configured in a way where the this stage is executed, you get the package tag as testing. So ending up from this tag, at this point you will have a package on your server, it will be the testing repository. So all the server with the testing repository will be able to test this package. Is it clear? I didn't lose? Yes. I have a question. You, you can't reuse the package you built with the scratch uh, phase. You have to rebuild it. In the scratch, yeah, you have to rebuild it. You have to resend it. I mean, I don't think you can reuse a scratch build promoted to uh, build. There's no, there, there's no promotion. There's no promotion to yeah, no. Uh, no. That is intentional. Although yeah, it was intentional. If you're always going to go to the build, there is the most scratch build. See any yes. Yeah, okay, we have secret tool to do things for, for Arch, but we won't speak oh, about it. It's secret. Pay no that. attention yeah. to the plugin behind the curtain. <laughs> Okay, so as you see, it's super easy. It's just calling commands. So if you have another tool than Koji to build RPM, Mock, you can do the same. So my workflow uses Koji, your workflow can use Mock, and GitLab CI as well. It's super easy. It's uh, I wanted to show you that you can create <coughs> task as well. Um, basically, uh, some kind of uh, dependency that you can inject in each task, so you don't have to rewrite everything. So here, for example, we use Kerberos, so we do all the, you get your Kerberos ticket before sending the build in this uh, little Koji Dev template. So this is how you define the template uh, in GitLab CI, basically. It's quite handy. And I want to show you the last step. Oh, I don't have the last step? Okay, I thought I had uh, one more step. So after that, we have, um, I'll show you because I think I was pretty sure I had it. Well, anyway, we have another stage that is exactly the same as kbuild but that will tag your package to staging and to production. So are you interested to see moving? Is it, if I lose two minutes to show you the code, is it better? Yes? Okay. Uh, because I need to find it. Um, can you read the terminal? <laughs> I, I can from here. <laughs> okay. So nice now, can I put that? Does that work? Ooh, it doesn't work. Probably uh, control plus. Yeah, on i3, RxVT, no. <laughs> no? I thought I had a thing. Okay, anyway, I will try to zoom after I found the file. 
and of course I lost my connection. Uh, okay, a second. <laughs> of course, live demo always goes wrong. Um, yes, my hotspot died. Okay. Come on, come on, come on. <coughs> Is the Wi-Fi connected again or it connected me to the wrong thing? Ah, yes, okay. Sorry, sorry. Hello. But apparently you can't contact uh, KDC from the Marriott guest. That's better. Uh, so this is it. last operation. So I won't be able to zoom. Can you see a bit or not at all? Nothing. Um, so you, you will see that compared to the other slide, the only thing that changes is the action from Koji. Instead of building, it's just a tag build action that you can see here. And something uh, that we add is it can't fail, this one. So we, we want to be warned if it fails. Uh, dependency we have none here but you can add if you want and the other thing is this step is manual so it's end it's executed only if you tag a release it's not executed for each commit so this is how in uh, in GitLab CI you can do this thing here you can put stage uh, deploy QA then you want to do it manually or and you want to, to do it only if it's tagged to something so this is uh, very handy, and uh, I will show you how it looks like now. So, this is four. Four. No. Four. Add four. Yes. Okay. Here we go. So if I go here. So this is our live GitLab thing. I just need to look for create repos. The thing I'm doing here. So we have project we have here, and here we have the CI/CD pipeline. So what it looks like, it's something like that. So I will show you one that was blocked in the past. Here. We never tagged anything, so it only executes the three stages, right? But if you look at this one, uh, do we have one that went for this one? For example, we executed the k-build stage. So basically, I will show you after. I will do the full thing uh, in live demo. I will show you how you can promote the package. So stay for a few more minutes. Um, so is it clear on how GitLab CI works? It's not very different from uh, from Jenkins and things like that. It's really similar. Uh, do you have any question on the GitLab CI part? No, it's clear. Good. So uh, something about FedPKG. So FedPKG is a tool to build uh, RPMs uh, from Pagure, and uh, you have the interface at koji.fedoraproject.org. We can check uh, it, I can show you actually, what Koji looks like for people not used to it. So this one is ours, but uh, kojifedora.org looks pretty much the same. So you have a list of builds, for example, let's see what people build while I was away. So you have people building some uh, Flume thing, Hadoop, uh, so basically this is the list of everything that is going on at CERN at this moment. And uh, we have pretty much, we have quite a lot of builds. We have 30,000, 45,000 builds. So it's not bad. And in terms of user, you can see users there. And we have 371, as I mentioned. And this is the builder, so it shows you a list of uh, how many builders. Uh, at this time, we, we have only uh, both architecture. We don't have uh, ARM64 on this instance. We have a test instance where we are doing some tests, but for the moment, we just build uh, for x 6664 and i386. 
Uh, that's pretty much it to show you Koji. So Fed package is a command line tool to uh, interact. It's uh, really well known from uh, everybody that work uh, with Fedora packages. So we needed something similar, so I was not very, uh, <laughs> very, uh, how do you say? I've lost the word, the word, sorry. Uh, innovative, I called it sound packaging. So the only difference is I decided to build it in Go because uh, I will need to support that on ES6, 7, and 8 for a few years. And uh, EL6 is Python 2.6, EL7 is Python 2.7, and EL8 is something we don't know yet, 3.6. <laughs> and it will have different Python. So uh, in terms of maintenance cost, we decided we'll go with a compiled language. And I wanted to play with Go as well, so let's be fair. <laughs> um, we couldn't reuse much of the code either because we talked to GitLab not to Pagger or to uh, standard <coughs> things. So this is part as well of the decision. And uh, this tool is basically just uh, talking to the API and uh, Git uh, run some uh, Git helper commands. So the goal is that a user can just come, say, send PKG, import my source RPM. It will create all the layout on the project side, everything. And then he can see it appear somewhere in his tag. And he will be able to install in his machine. So the, the Linux team, we have 50,000 machines and uh, we have in total, two FTE for Linux, so two person full time. And uh, this will not grow, but we expect to double the number of machines in the next year. So as well, we need help on the packaging side. So making it super easy to build packages for standard users or people uh, with a more of physic physics backgrounds than uh, engineering uh, will help us a lot to get contribution. So our goal with this package uh, is, to, uh, is to get some uh, contribution uh, faster than what we have. And I would like to say thanks to Zanzi, who is developing the GoGitLab uh, API wrapper for, for Go. It's super nice, uh, it's super nice uh, project and it works very well. So unfortunately, I won't be able to show you much of some package today because uh, I have been caught in other stuff, so I didn't really finish the whole code. So if you're interested, uh, I can share uh, some tips, uh, but I can't share the code really right now. I was expecting to finish for first then, but unfortunately, uh, some of the things happened. So, uh, but basically, it's a, it will create a GitLab CI file for you and uh, all the configuration needed for an infrastructure. So you will just need to know what is the RPM, import it, and work on it. Patch it, and it will work for you. This is the goal. So I think, what time is it? Do I still have time? Uh, four minutes. Four minutes? OK, so I won't do uh, the live demo, because it will take a bit more. Sorry. For the but I will take any questions. Any questions? Yes. So I'm from Fedora CI and Rail CI team. So um, my question is, do you uh, you currently said you build and then manually promote packages to stage and in production? Uh, do you plan to add auto tests and do you plan to use standard test rules which we plan to implement in Fedora uh, and redo in Fedora as a part of this kit? Uh, have you looked at it? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> we looked at it and we want it, but uh, we didn't have time uh, yet. So we will look at you. You, we, you are our uh, inspiration, right? Uh, I mean, uh, for, I didn't retake the full fed package thing because it's really different from what we were, we want to do, and we are we, we really want to keep uh, compatibility for six, seven, and eight. And for with Python, it's quite hard at this time. But uh, we're really uh, looking forward to what you're doing and to try to follow uh, your lead. Any other question? No? Yes, please. Uh, do you only build a pen with, uh, uh, with Koji and Python uh, and GitLab CI? Or uh, you also run CI jobs on the RPM to build? So we don't now, but this is uh, we have planned to run some RPL, RPM lint, uh, all the thing. You you could add a stage in there for doing other CI. We don't do it yet because it's quite early. But yes, the goal after would be uh, to maybe check if people didn't put password or thing like that. So you can add steps in the CI to do that. And uh, but yes. something more involved like uh, functional test. As well, you can execute uh, anything. Uh, as you see. 
functional testing of uh, RPM because um, these repos are for RPM, right? They are not for the code. The code have another repo where people run tests and it's as well in GitLab. But we separate, we have a really a way to keep a, a package, it's really a package git uh, repo, it's not the full code, it's a, it's a snapshot of the code. Yeah, but you don't, you don't want to run functional tests on uh, code that have been packaged and deployed by their package, why not? We could, we could. It's not that we don't want, but it's just that we expect uh, the people shipping the tar GZ for this version to have done all the uh, coding. <coughs> this is the, we, we expect that because we are on the same team, right? But yes. But sometime in packaging, Agreed. you should use this user. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't so. have the same dependencies because you are still dependency in the Yes. No, clearly, clearly. It, we, could, we need to add more uh, tests and uh, we'll try to do more functional testing, uh, but at this time we don't do much. Anything else? Okay. Thank you.